Greetings and welcome to No BS Baking. You got JP here, and I just want to say that when you think about baking, what can be more enjoyable, relaxing, and personally satisfying, right? Well, I think we can all agree that sometimes things just don't quite go as planned. So let's have a little chuckle and then look at some useful tips to help us avoid these issues. Now I don't have time to in this video to cover all the bakery items that I've shown there, but let's get bread and rolls out of the way. If you want to reduce or eliminate bread faults, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but measure by weight, not volume. Don't trust your flour and its performance is the same as theirs. When in doubt, go with a good high protein bread flour and stick with it until you got your product nailed and then fine tune from there. Make sure you can see a window pane after mixing, or at least after mixing and the rest period. Take that little bit of extra time and put the recipe into Baker's Percent so you can quickly evaluate it and potentially modify it methodically if needed for the next go. Final dough temperature of 78 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 Celsius after mixing is always stated by Baker's for good reason. Focus on this. Adjust your water temperatures where required. This is an important step. Concentrate on getting your bench and proof times to proper standards. Now we'll talk more about this in a little bit. Now it's important to understand your dough weight per piece, especially if you're using preformed pans or Banneton proofing baskets. Now this also will be discussed further shortly. Don't let the surface of your dough get dry. It should be moist and slightly tacky right up to baking. Make sure your bread is uniform, final shaped with tension and that the seams are closed and positioned at the bottom of the loaf. Sloppy final shaping is a common cause of disaster, either in finished appearance, gas retention, or both. Now, professional bakers may or may not use steam in their ovens, but as a beginner, a little steam in the oven chamber can help delay the top crust formation, which can provide some oven rise benefits. Well, this is kind of a no-brainer, but be patient. Hot or warm bread turns into a gooey mess if sliced too warm. 
For most of us, we simply just go out there and find a recipe and give it a try. Sometimes we're lucky and the product's nice or maybe okay, and sometimes it's not. So what went wrong and how can I improve it next time? If you want to avoid fails, start with a practical evaluation of the recipe. Make sure you have the things needed. I mean, swapping AP flour where bread flour is called for or only adding one small egg because that's all you got in the fridge may seem a reasonable option. But if this is your first attempt at the recipe, not a good idea. Here's a basic white pan bread recipe I pulled off the web. Now this one I was lucky as it also listed the ingredients in grams. Now, if you're actually baking using measuring cups, spoons, and the like, evaluating the recipe is difficult. They're not particularly accurate and really tell you nothing about the critical aspects of the recipe. Because this recipe was expressed in weights also, I was able to quickly lay it out into baker's percent and get a much better understanding of what to expect. Here is what this recipe tells me. Yeast is slightly higher than the standard of 1%, however, this still contains 10% sugar, so at this level, the increase is sound. The salt in the dough is under the 2% standard, but at 1.6%, it's hanging in there at an acceptable level. Now, 12% butter is being used, so I will want to take this into consideration when mixing the dough. I personally would opt for delaying the butter until the dough is well on its way to development before adding it. Now, warm whole milk assumes that you're baking in a similar environment as they are. This may not be the case. I would treat the milk the same as water and add it at a temperature that delivers a final dough temperature of 78 degrees Fahrenheit or 25 degrees Celsius. Now, two large eggs. Well, this doesn't really tell you much, but when you do the math, it tells you a lot. So what's the total hydration of this dough? Is it low? Is it high? Is it in good range? Can I work with it? Now, if I didn't do some basic math, I would not have a clue about this recipe and just hope that it all works out. So before I even start to bake, I adjusted the salt to 2%. I want to optimize the strength of the dough. As I showed previously, I figured out the hydration and it's around 60%, which is a nice, safe start point. By laying the recipe out like this, I was able to determine the batch weight and it's 980 grams. So I follow my own pan to dough weight rules. I'll need a two pound loaf tin or two one pound loaf tins to get my dough weight to pan capacity within acceptable ranges. Because flour is different around the world, brand to brand, etc. You've heard me go on about this forever. Recommended dough hydration is all over the place online. How much water should I use in bagels, or pizza dough, tortillas, or any of the other many types of bread, bread products? It's tricky, and selecting the wrong hydration or just arbitrarily using the recipe author's hydration plan can lead to dis disaster, especially if you're making the product for the first time. So here I took quite a few hours and scoured the internet for not only hydration ranges used in these products, but also carefully selected a common sense safety start point that takes into consideration flour variables across all purpose and bread flour recipes. Remember, these are start point guidelines to give you the best chance of success when trying a new recipe. Optimum hydration based on your brand of flour, your desired product, is a learning curve that is realized through practice and small controlled adjustments. Why is 1% yeast and 2% salt the basis of most recipes? Fermentation time balance. Why do many bakers recommend a one hour rest time and around a one hour final proof time? Fermentation time balance. Salt, among other things, controls the rate of fermentation. Bakers may adjust their yeast levels slightly one way or the other, but the goal is to attain around double in size in about an hour at room temperature and final proof in around an hour by placing the dough in a slightly warmer environment. This standard is common baking practice for many yeast leavened breads and rolls. Bakers opting for overnight refrigerated bulk fermentation most often use these same salt and yeast standards. However, final proofing may be extended due to the cool temperatures of the dough. Fast rising doughs are not better and can lead to issues faster. If same day baking, work towards adjustment of your yeast to attain the one hour rest and one hour proof time plan.
It's common for bakers to make minor adjustments to yeast levels from time to time and product to product. So if 1% instant yeast is a common start point, here are a few reasons why you may need to adjust your yeast levels either up or down. On the increase side, I just wanted to clarify the first point. The tighter the dough or the less water you have in it, the slower the yeast activity. Pending the product, slight increases may be need, may needed to be made. Regarding the reduced yeast side, I think these are pretty much self-explanatory. Salt is available in many forms and granule size. Many recipes just list salt as an ingredient, but you look in your cupboard and you have a coarse kosher salt. Now can you use it? Of course you can, but keep in mind one tablespoon of, of table salt is not equal to one tablespoon of coarse salt by weight. And this is where bakers can run into issues when using volumetric measures. Always weigh salt. Salt in bread making needs to be sodium chloride or NaCl, not a salt substitute. Without sodium chloride in the dough at proper levels, you can be, you can be faced with an absolute sticky, weak nightmare that translates into disaster. Now, potassium chloride is the only generally acceptable partial replacement for sodium in bread dough. And you can find out more about this in my video on salt. Now I've talked so many times about salt and the importance of using a standard 2% by weight based on flour when trying a new recipe. Yet, this remains one of the most common causes of product issues for new bake. As you move to levels under 2%, you can start to notice changes, slightly at first and then more pronounced as you get closer to the 1% mark. Now 1% is a tipping point for breads, especially where you want volume. Now depending your flour, the temperature of your kitchen, the amount of water in the dough and how you handle it during the proofing and baking, it could work one day and completely flop the next. So don't set yourself up for disappointment. I mean, today you feel like baking some bread or buns for dinner, but you don't bake often, so you're gonna find an interesting recipe online and give it a whirl. Now, there are many types uh, of breads to choose from, and you feel that a nice enriched white bread with eggs, say soy flour and butter, looks amazing. So you go for it. And voila, you did it. It wasn't the best loaf you ever seen, but it worked and it smells great and the family seems generally impressed. So where I'm going with this is don't be afraid to experiment. Baking is practice and understanding your ingredients, the process and the timing. Now that being said, as a new baker, start with basic simple recipe before jumping into more complex products. As an example, one viewer contacted me about help on making pastry with a high amount of layers without understanding the basic techniques and processes used for simpler products like basic croissants. Now they state they're having trouble. I wonder why. So in simple terms, get the basics mastered and then move on from there. Now, if you really want to improve your baking consistency and overall success, then you need the right tools. Baking is a science and it all starts with the recipe. Now I've created some tools which I use all the time for not only understanding recipes, but also to provide me with some common calculations for modifying or adjusting recipes to work better based on the ingredients I have available in my region, my environment, and the process I opt for. For those of you dealing with flour quality issues, here's a quick calculator for taking, say, all-purpose flour and dialing it up to provide the strength of a high-quality bread flour through the addition of vital wheat gluten. So what temperature should the water or milk I add be at? Now, to ensure my dough is 78 or 25 degrees Celsius after either machine mixing or hand mixing, this calculator is a perfect tool for giving you a methodical water temperature start point that works for most mixers and mixing processes. So if I add two eggs or even just two egg whites, how does this affect my total dough hydration? Now this calculator uses industry averages and is perfect for dialing in and understanding your dough's total hydration. 
I have a few template variations for home bakers to easily build a recipe from scratch and another for modifying existing recipes that you get online or in books. Now, I won't get into these in detail here due to the length of, of the video already, but I'll be demonstrating the power and usefulness of these tools in an upcoming video.